Uh, my name is Mike Lake, the Executive Director of the World Class Today Partnership, and I do believe that one of the signs of a successful gathering of people is one in which there is a lot of communication and chatter, so uh, I'm glad to see that so many of us are having conversation already this morning. Um, thank you for uh, bearing with me and, and letting me interrupt those conversations, but I promise you'll have time later to, to re-engage. Um, I want to start this morning with some thank yous, um, and before I do that, just a reminder to everybody that we are filming this, uh, it will be broadcast, and uh, we appreciate your participation in all of that. Um, so I want to thank Cape Cod uh, Media Center uh, for their participation me, and Sorry. for their um, willingness and kindness to, to videotape this for us. I also want to thank WPBH and the Forum Network for airing this on, on their online forum. Um, I want to thank my fellow co-hosts, Yoon Lee of the Boston World Partnership. Um, Yoon has been incredibly generous in her time and effort and energy and has been a wonderful partner in bringing all of us together today. Uh, finally, I want to thank State Street. Uh, State Street has been uh, with World Class Cities Partnership from the very, very beginning. It has given us our seed funding. It believed in, in this program when it was just a dream and an idea. And uh, without their support and continued support, uh, we would certainly not be here today. So I want to thank State Street. And I want to thank all of you. Thank you for joining us so early uh, in the morning. And I uh, hope everybody had a good night's sleep. Uh, well rested for a day of, of great conversation, idea uh, sharing and exchange. and. Uh, with that, I'm going to um, just talk a little bit about World Class Cities Partnership. It is an organization that has come together to build a network of cities around the world. Cities that can exchange and identify best practices in public policy so that we can find solutions to urban challenges and share those globally. Um, we launched in June of last year, uh, and in that time we have achieved tremendous success. We're on a wonderful trajectory. We now have eight partner cities that include Guadalajara, Boston, of course, Vancouver, Dublin, Lisbon, Barcelona, Haifa, Hangzhou, and we just announced our newest partner, Hamburg, which we will make official uh, early next month. Um, we've also launched a graduate student course um, that allows students at Northeastern University in their second, second year of a master's to participate in the World Class Cities Partnership Research to be partnered with one of our cities. And also early next month, each of those students will be visiting their respective partner city uh, for a week of field research. So it's a wonderful opportunity to engage our partners around the world and to give our students in the Boston area an opportunity uh, to expand their international network and to see how public policy is uh, initiated, created, implemented around the world. Um, the purpose of this Chatham Forum is, is really a gathering of people who are committed to improving Massachusetts and the greater Boston area. It's all about idea creation and exchange. We hope that you are inspired by each other, um, that you will share your ideas, gain momentum for those ideas, uh, and that there will be next steps, that there will be follow through. World Class Cities Partnership is here to partner with you uh, in helping to facilitate and, and make these ideas a reality. Um, first panel this morning is uh, a recap of the recent trip to Barcelona and Madrid. We had a delegation of Boston area leaders that spent a week in those two cities. Um, and when we came back, we did a debriefing. That debriefing basically boiled it down to four topics that we learned while we were in Spain that we think can apply uh, to Boston. The first is the concept of placemaking. We have so many clusters or innovation districts or, or zones or whatever you want to call them, whether it be Longwood Medical, Tendall Square, uh, the new uh, innovation district in Boston. Placemaking is about how you, how you transform that from a bunch of boundaries on a map into a sense of community. Um, so our panel discussion this morning will we'll touch on that. Second topic is the idea of marketing and branding our city, our region, and our state. Uh, we have so much to be proud of, and 
we, we do have a presence in the global arena. But our challenge is to continue to increase that presence, to tell our story, the story of a city, the story of a region, the story of a state that has the greatest concentration of talent anywhere on this planet. And our challenge is to retain that talent, which is the third topic, talent development, attraction, and retention. And the last topic is barriers to entry. Every community has barriers to entry, whether it be on a personal, cultural side, or whether it be on a business side. And on the business side, we, we think we can tackle some of these challenges so that whether you're an entrepreneur trying to decide whether you want to stay in, in Massachusetts, or if you're an international company uh, somewhere else in the world, and you're looking to open an office in the United States, that Boston is your choice, and that it is easy and welcoming for you to do so. This past week, we, we heard a lot about Boston. Boston of, of the past, of the 1960s, and its remarkable trans transformation since then. Much of that is attributed to um, former mayor, Kevin White, who was mayor of Boston from 1968 to 1984. Um, Kevin really did transform a city. His legacy will last much longer than all of us. Um, so I thought it only fitting that this morning to start us off uh, in the spirit of transformation, in the spirit of idea creation, um, and bringing people together to improve the city, that we would pay tribute to Mayor Kevin White, um, as I said, Boston Mayor from 1968 to 
Kevin White and his administration brought to Massachusetts and to Boston. As you saw in that last quote, um, uh, to be a leader, it requires innovation. And we are here today to, to be innovative, to be leaders in our community, to expand what we've already started talking about and bring it to new levels, to take our ideas and bring them forth. Kevin was the closest thing I had to a grandfather, and he taught me so much. Part of that was um, a real value of, of, uh, of how to value conviction, mm -hmm. the power of your hopes and your dreams. And he inspired me and so many others to really dream big, as he did, to be bold. So today, I'm asking all of you in his, in his honor to be bold, to think new ideas, mm -hmm. to bring your own ideas to new levels. And to, to, together, we will make this Chatham Forum a truly remarkable experience, not only for those here, but for the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. So without further ado, I want to introduce our first panelist. Um, joining us this morning is Tom Palmer from Tom Palmer Communications. Tom had over 30 years of experience at the Boston Globe. Um, and uh, he will be, uh, he and Lowell will be talking to us about placemaking. Lowell Richards is uh, at Massport. He's the, I might get this title wrong, Lowell, but he's the uh, managing director, is that right? Chief development officer. Chief development officer uh, for Massport. Um, and uh, who, as I said, will be joining Tom and talking about placemaking. We have Yoon Lee from Boston World Partnerships. Um, I've already talked a little bit about Yoon, but uh, this morning she'll be talking about branding and marketing of the city. We, ha we have Joe uh, Albanese and Bob Buckley. Joe Albanese, Albanese is the uh, CEO and founder of Commodore Builders, and Bob Buckley is a partner, senior partner at Weimar and Bronski, and uh, they will be discussing barriers to entry. So without further ado, Tom and Hope. squeezing our fellow panelists out of their time. So I would say, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk, but I'm just going to keep pushing the arrow. Um, and I, I, this is a different environment from previous times, in my opinion, and therefore, I'm not uncomfortable not finishing my sentence, because the idea is to get visuals, to get started ideas, to start asking. You are all quick absorbers, so um, we will motor through. Please make it. what we'll try to try and cover in 12 minutes. <laughs> uh, Barcelona is a different city, different environment, different, <laughs> different uh, uh, climate, uh, but clearly they have an idea about organizing uh, surface transportation in a variety of ways, which when you're in the district, you realize there's certain characteristics to it. And this was a nice we, we had it, not everything was planned. This was an accommodation. They right. A lot of scooters, they need space, they don't want to tie them on light poles. And so they strike the streets off, and many streets look like this. And we started that in Boston, but we're clearly not nearly as far down the road as they are. Um, so it's a it's a, uh, a beautiful old city, a lot of uh, symmetry, seven and eight story buildings, a lot of great old architecture, and um, and conducive, obviously, we've talked about the innovation, but it draws a lot of people from around the world, especially since the Olympics in the 80s, which was their big event. Not uh, unlike uh, Fort Point Channel in terms of scale, the older buildings, and because of the airplanes that come from Logan Airport, buildings, new buildings in the Innovation District can't be taller than 15 or 16 stories. So we will have a scale in this area that has a certain similar feel to it, somewhat higher, uh, but not dramatically so. Barcelona. So these are some visuals of older buildings. And this is, and that last one just shows a little bit of the, what to me was the most striking thing in my first, it was my first time in Barcelona, is the corners don't have right angles. In the new part of the city, which is most of it. Everybody here can bring the lights down a little bit because 
and bees are not jumping out. But to, to Tom's point, this is the chamfered corner. Every corner, all four corners of every intersection, you have chamfered edges, and it makes for an incredible feeling about each intersection. So they're all public squares. Now, how we can do that in a big district in Boston, I don't know. Um, John Hines, the other developers might not want to give up that space that you cut off and give back to the uh, to the city, but it's an extraordinary di dimension of, of Barcelona that once, makes it very- Once you go to Barcelona once, you immediately know you're back there because it's an architectural feature of the whole city, which is really remarkable. This is their uh, equivalent of the government center. <laughs> And it's a, a wonderful place, although you may you know, and a lot of the squares we found, some of them are decorated and designed and, and landscaped, some are not. That much is well used, even on rainy days, like we, it rained the whole week we were there. But uh, we found some of them just big spaces, open spaces between, between busy buildings. This is a uh, biotech research facility. Um, it's right on the Mediterranean. Uh, we didn't have any sun when we were there, which of course is highly unusual for Barcelona, and people constantly apologize to us about it. I've had the privilege of being to Barcelona several times before, so I know it was a true aberration. But as a research loca location for people to go out on this central plaza and down to the, the beach, literally across the street, um, it apparently is remarkable in terms of what's going on there. It was a remarkable tour that we had, but it was a wonderful place-making position to see such a a, a um, cutting edge facility as to what's going on with cutting edge architecture at a waterfront location, which was just, just felt and this wonderful. Is, and this is place finding as well as place making. They had a working port here. Right. They had turned their back on the Mediterranean, believe it or not, like we had on our harbor for a long time. And they placed this here. They actually brought sand in, made a beach, moved their working harbor up to the north. This is near the Olympics area, and now it's extraordinary. Yeah, I, I'll, in terms of placemaking, just amplifying on that, people who grew up in Barcelona can't imagine and still can't imagine swimming there in the summer. And they are really freaked out by all the foreigners, i.e. people from outside Barcelona, who come there and swim because it was not unlike what we went through in terms of a completely polluted and industrial harbor, which had been completely transformed. And the Barcelonans themselves are still coming to grips with the fact that they've got this asset they've all been brought up saying they always went up 30, 40 miles of coast on the Mediterranean for the summer to go swimming. This is just another public space, obviously conducive to a Mediterranean climate, but that's a, uh, an economics graduate school. And La Rambla, the, uh, the model for the Greenway, I heard more about that in the 10 years while the Greenway was being de designed than anything else. Uh, the great public uh, promenade through um, through uh, Barcelona, and of course, uh, it's nothing. No place, no public space is anything without cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my take on Laurent Ramblas and, and the relevance to it of the Greenway, everybody says, well, gee, why isn't like Laurent Ramblas? And say, excuse me, Laurent Ramblas took 300 years to become what it is. We aren't even really into 10 years of the Greenway. So open spaces create their own life and characteristics over an extended period of time. So a little patience will go a long way. And, and there's not a blade of grass on the wrong list. There are dark, the greenway is half grass and half yeah. Sure. Um, what else can you say? Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> uh, this is a cathedral uh, originally um, designed uh, by Gaudi, um, still in design, been under construction for the better part of a century. Um, it's now been closed after, what, 90 years before they finally got the roof on it? Right. Um, it's Sagrada Familia. Um, it will, they say it'll be finished. It will never be finished. But that's part of why people come to see it, right. to see a work in progress. Either it's some different, and now there is an interior. It is, when the last two times I was there, there wasn't an interior, so it was wonderful to see it progress to an interior. This is, a, this is actually a through your curve on this one. This is actually the City Hall, 15th right. century right. City Hall, right. uh, one of the great um, uh, historic spaces, uh, like, this, like the State House across the uh, square. Yeah. Um, this, anybody want to venture what the prime tenant is in this building? The equivalent of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. <laughs> it was commissioned for a publicly owned utility. It's really neat architecture, once again, without the blue sky and sunlight, 
uh, smart to do, but we've used our pictures as opposed to pictures from the marketing brochure. But uh, I don't think we've got the guts in Boston yet to commission a cutting edge architecture for our, uh, I mean, we got so burned by City Hall in 1967 when the commission was done. But that's an example of venturesome views of what to do with the public realm by the public sector. And it marks their march on the 22 innovation district, an old industrial district, which was rezoned and uh, you can now uh, identify it from miles away at that building. And this was a series of two or three buildings in the innovation district, which is a mixture of old and new. Um, and it's, it's very, very, to some people, disjointed, to other people, um, it, it, eclectic. Mm -hmm. depends on your approach to architecture and, and urban design. Mm -hmm. They basically rezoned and said to the developers in this area, we'll give you added FAR and height if you give some of the space back to the city for public areas, public spaces. And the result is a lot of buildings that were empty and that were, where the uh, uses, the manufacturers and all were moving out of the city, it drew it back in so the district is, is uh, in the process of beginning to thrive. This is not a modern construction. So that's the, the, the uh, government they tie. Uh, they, they, essentially, their state, their state house. Mm -hmm. and, and I put in um, one shot of that uh, to lead up to the next one, which is um, adaptive reuse. This, uh, this room in a lower floor of the government they tie was unusable because of what you can see were formerly columns. Those came down and you couldn't have any good gathering in there with any audio, visual, or anything. They basically put new structure in the ceiling of this building, cut the columns off, and now it's widely used for government and public. These are where the columns came down, and they are no more. And the ceiling is supported by inserted seal superstructure that's holding up uh, the roof that was previously held up by columns. And holding up, next slide, not, not, uh, only, not only holding up the roof, but that's what's right above it. Right on that square. So the, the steel escaping. The steel inserted steel structure is basically a, a steel grid under the plaza and over the ceiling of the room that you previously saw. And again, not just decades, but centuries old. Right. Yeah, we talk about our old state house and our new state house. That state house was built 200 years before our old state house. So, you know. right, so just a little bit of whiplash here. We're going to a couple of brief slides from the trip a year before to Haifa, which is. Uh, which is kind of the Cambridge of Israel, the, uh, the innovation area. And that building, that That's tall building, building, was a national building. It's not used for innovation, it's used for bureaucracy. But they put that building there as a symbol on the edge of their innovation district in the, on the waterfront, which is similar to our waterfront, with some old and some new in, uh, in Haifa. These are the older buildings, kind of the equivalent of our uh, uh, Fort Point uh, Channel buildings, our Boston Wharf buildings, obviously in much worse shape. Uh, but they are gradually being um, used and, and adapted for reuse. This is one of the old buildings, but they put a new, uh, they, they've renovated an inside, and that's the new skin. So, uh, visual branding by uh, signage. Uh, we've got a uh, you know, fairly disreputable cast of characters to come against the wall. The Barcelona Act Activa and uh, at Barcelona 22 is a series of branding uh, approaches that you don't want to get into more, but there is visual branding to buildings. There isn't, to our somewhat surprise, and to my surprise, because I, I had the luxury of going to Barcelona uh, exactly 11 years ago when they were just conceiving of Barcelona Activity and Act 22 in Barcelona. I was surprised to see there wasn't more visual branding of the district. You, unless you know you're in it, you don't know you're in it by, by seeing. So there's no lines, there's no marketing of the, no signage as to the district. But buildings are signed, and you become familiar, you know you're there on a building basis, not on a region or a neighborhood basis. So this is a, a university outside of the downtown area, and um, you'll see in the next couple of slides, pretty conventional architecture, like you might see on any campus anywhere. But as we found in a couple of places, and this, this being the outside of Barcelona, they put a 
a, a visual um, symbol there to mm -hmm. signify that it's some, there, there's something other than um, than the, the uh, normal um, business going on. And we're told that they're no, they're not representative Parmesan cheese twists. Okay. There's actually a cultural <laughs> representation here. Um, not, not, not so I first thought about when I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, Technion, this is uh, back in uh, Israel, um, type of Technion, the MIT of Israel. Um, we look, we have, took a couple pictures of buildings there, fairly conventional. Uh, but they also have their symbol, and you know exactly where you are from miles around when you see that. We but have, we have some few symbols of our own. <laughs> um, and as most of you who are familiar with the area know, um, for many years the sign had gone dark. Um, and it's now a point of pride amongst a number of us, including the owners of the, that building, that it kept up. Uh, there were a few, few letters that were out for a while, but they've been back on. We complain about it, and our time goes up, the lights come up. Right. Uh, these, these obviously, these, these uh, categories overlap a bit, but wayfinding specifically, as opposed to uh, architecture, for instance, uh, we found, we, we didn't find a lot of examples that we could uh, emulate here. We put some ideas up on things that we could consider doing in the, uh, in the innovation district to make it distinctive. Um, and uh, Lola and I both pulled some signs, for instance, off of, off of the web. I mean, that's to obviously exists right there on the seaboard in the next one as well. Um, but then we pulled some others off that are larger, in some cases lighted. This is Georgia, is it? Yeah. Um, one of the things I've thought about for the Innovation District, many of you probably know Massachusetts Port Authority owns a significant, by no means market majority, but significant portion of land in the area. And branding to us is an important issue. Uh, we have a working closely with the Convention Center and the BRA, we're making some, some visual progress. There are traditional signs up in the area now, wayfinding signs. I would love to get, figure out a way to have solar or other uh, powered uh, uh, street signs that are larger in format. Hey, I'm older, so my eyesight sucks. Um, and there are a lot of us still down there. But I think about San Francisco and Los Angeles, and you can see the signs you know, long before you get there. Um, and the idea of having this area sign, um, not unlike along with medical area is in terms of a distinctive area, I think has merit. The question is, can we do it in a way that's a little bit more, more noteworthy than simply changing the color and putting a line over the top to really brand the area? Um, I'm trying to do these fast, but okay. Um, so we look for ideas on this, really, right. uh, wayfinding, um, wayfinding creativity. We're looking for that today. And finally, our own district. Now this, uh, I took this from, uh, from, from the waterfront in the Haifa, which is similar to our waterfront, kind of wide open. They don't even have parking lots here. Uh, and it, is a, it is a working port like, uh, like uh, ours to some extent is, although this is even more so again, if we put our innovation district in Charleston. The first thing they put down there was a sports stadium, a soccer, soccer stadium, not because of a popular vote or because uh, uh, because they took a poll that the mayor wanted. So some, some of you remember, we tried that, but the mayor didn't want it. So <laughs> it didn't happen about 12, well, now 15 years ago. Again, the old area, you can see the federal building behind it on the edge of the district. Um, one of their very uh, modern um, cutting edge hospitals, um, and, and of course they took an exhaust stack and decorated it and made it a symbol. Sometimes it's just uh, a very explicit brand. This is a Google facility, right? Uh, one of the two large buildings that have moved in down there in the last couple of years. Once again, Hypa, uh, Dive, uh, Intel is the other one. And uh, our innovation district. Right on the edge of downtown, a lot of space. We have our valuable old architecture. Sometimes I'm amazed at the variety in the uh, Boston North Building. And, and, and one of the differences between Barcelona is the values have run up on these buildings to a much greater extent than the values have run up on the older buildings in Barcelona at 22 District. And therefore, the ability to be flexible 
in Boston the way they are there has been greatly diminished by the underlying economics. Some things you just can't make work based on how much a, a building has been paid, purchased for sometime in the last 10 years. In many chains in Barcelona still, the, the buildings haven't changed hands recently. You can go fairly fast through these. When you see them in sequence like this, you really realize we've got great bones in the Ward Point Channel area, and it's, it's really, 100 years from now, this will be real assets. Another great asset. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, things are changing fast. That's Fan Pier, four cranes. I tell Tim Fallon that uh, in uh, Harvard only had five cranes up at one time, and also they've got four up here already on the two new Vertex buildings. Some of our old, of course, is combined with the new. That's FP3 on Congress Street, Berkeley's building. And of course, just across the channel, uh, Atlantic Wharf, uh, with a good piece of the old Russia Wharf. I'm going to say, known to many of us who've been around too long at Russia Wharf, and we're still trying to change our terminology. This is the uh, uh, part of the Massport footprint in the World Trade Center area. For those of you who don't know, um, it's always better to be lucky than good. Uh, I genuinely don't believe the Seaport District would be anywhere close to where it is, but for Ned Johnson's vision in the 80s and 90s. Those three buildings were built with the Johnson family and Fidelity personal checkbook. There wasn't a construction loan on them. Nobody was there. That family said, we're going to do it. It's the right vision in, the, in cooperation with Massport. They did it. They all have debt on them now. They're tagging along. West office building um, and east office building both. Um, that's east. This is west. Um, all of their original, virtually all of their original tenants, their original tenancies have turned over and they've all stayed here. So Nutter has renewed. Foley has renewed, AEW has renewed, Cabot Corp has renewed. Um, so the, the, the anchor capacity that these, this area did, thanks to Mr. Johnson, is, is truly a critical component of why this area has the chance of being more successful as well. And the restaurants have arrived, right? These are all in, in, our, in the, in the uh, South Boston waterfront. That's the manual life, now known as the John Hancock headquarters. Uh, it was fairly cutting edge, one of the lead, first lead certified office buildings. That was 12 years ago um, when we started down that path. Um, the closing for this was done two weeks after 9-11. If that had been a spec developer, that building would never have. Manual life was gonna do it as their US headquarters. They said they're gonna close, and we just plowed through uh, to make sure we got it closed and locked down. And that's lead platinum. That's it. Right. The New Liberty Wharf, the old Jimmy's Harbor side, on the water side the area of it. Um, yeah. Very, very successful uh, restaurants. Uh, to all of us who are involved in this, we knew it was the right location for, for long term success. None of us, including Ron Berkowitz, had any idea that it would be so, so successful right out of the box. And some more of our new architecture. Our very new architecture, um, yes. the Boston Tea Party, opening this summer. Suffolk Special Projects, I really, really, uh, you actually didn't need fast forward to see that happen go up quickly. You just stay, sit there and watch it. It seemed like from morning to night every day, it, it advanced. Um, and this is the future. This is uh, the first two buildings in the first phase of uh, Seaport Square, the old Franklin Court plan. Um, John Hine with the Boston Global Investors was with us this morning, fortunately. Um, this is, uh, these are the two buildings on the west, closest to downtown, near the Barking Crab, and the Daily Catch, um, two apartment buildings with uh, four levels of retail um, on, the, uh, on the lower floors, and a open glass atrium connector between the two on the extension of Courthouse Way. Right through here, the bottom floor, the bottom of those floor, four floors will be completely open uh, for, for pedestrians uh, in the summer. Very good weather. Three uh, And this is the end of the, that was two views, one from, the other one was two, one from Seaport and one then from Northern Avenue. And this is the Innovation Center, an early action item, part of Seaport Square uh, that will get into construction pretty soon. John and others here know um, more about that. And as 
symbol scope, this is one of the newest ones, the, uh, the high definition uh, media tower on Summer Street at the convention center. Um, has uh, events and messages for people who are at the conventions, uh, capable of uh, gathering tweets from people who are there saying, meet me at a certain restaurant. Um, it'll, have, it'll have some advertising, it'll have uh, uh, probably some news and weather and that kind of thing in collaboration with one of the uh, local media and um, just really the biggest new symbol we have, managed by a company out of Columbus called Orange Barrel Media. Thank you. Thank you.
very open and has produced these artists and architects that has really transformed many um, how architecture is, is defined today. Um, but what was also remarkable was that about 15 years ago, um, they didn't, the, even the residents of Barcelona didn't know that much about Gaudi. Um, and so the city really took initiative to um, put his, all his work together, create programming around it, and really promote it as a destination for tourists and even for their local residents. Um, so it sort of communicated to us that even the best work um, of the 20th century um, needs sometimes the help of the city and, and then the community to promote, uh, be promoted. And of course, it also has Dali and Picasso and along in the mix. Um, today, Barcelona is um, known as the city of modern architecture. Um, we showed this, uh, uh, I think, the open side of this building, which is the Barcelona Biomedical Research Park. Um, and it faces out to the beach, which actually the city made. Um, and now the beach really plays as a, a space where uh, the six research centers that are in this park um, have competition. They get, go out there in the summer and they just have a really great time. So um, it really not only communicates that Barcelona is where you can have a beautiful building that's attractive to um, you know, research from all over the world, but they're also very mindful about surrounding it with um, you know, great um, you know, nature and um, uh, creating a space where um, they, they can also have fun. So, and we showed this um, earlier as well. Uh, this really note, noted as a gateway to technology district in, in Barcelona. This won the um, uh, Pritzker Prize. The Jean Nouvel is a very famous architect, French architect. And um, actually all the architecture that I will show you in, in my presentation all were either winners or on the short list of various architecture prizes around the world. And so I think this obviously plays into uh, shaping their brand um, and also promoting Barcelona as a city that's very forward thinking, um, innovative and creative and very friendly to uh, the creatives around uh, in, from the world. Um, so similarly, this Mediatek is uh, a building that we visited, and as you can see, it's very, um, it's very unique looking, and it also won uh, the World Building of the Year in 2011, and it's known to be uh, very sustainable, very eco-friendly, and uses materials. The, the silver and green materials are um, reflectors, and they change color uh, depending on the day and the, the climate. Um, Media Complex is, um, we threw this in there because it's what we wanted to demonstrate that they didn't lose some of the old architecture as they were building new um, buildings. And this is a project that was done with a, um, a media company, Media Pro, which is the bottom left building, um, a university. And um, I think there's an incubator space as well. So a lot of the projects are done in private public partnerships, and um, they want to create as much of a cluster you know that is how innovation is created. So um, now I want to talk about how uh, Barcelona has used global events as a way to market itself. Um, I feel like almost every presentation that we sat through, they always refer to the Olympic Games, 1992 Olympic Games, as really um, the global game that put Barcelona on the global map um, as a city that was modern and um, great for visitors from all around the world. Um, and as, as any Olympic Games do to a lot of uh, cities, it helped them to pave roads, build new buildings, you know, just uh, create different zones, and, um, and really clean up the city. And they really utilized the Olympic Games really well, though. And then um, to the right, the picture to the, to the right is um, they're hosting 2013 Aquatic Championship Games. And since it's in the city, we really see such a quite a striking powerful image of um, you know, the, the landscape and then, and then the things that's being placed, uh, posted there. Um, Barcelona is known as the mobile capital of the world right now, and we believe that um, becoming a host to the Mobile World Congress the last two years and will be for the next couple of years to come has really placed them, um, again, on the innovation global map uh, as, a, as a city that is hosting and convening um, companies and innovators from all around the world um, talking about an industry that, as we all know, is growing very, very quickly. And it's 
it's not too shabby. That's the Converse space um, in the big picture down there. And um, so it's quite remarkable. And they um, they have a lot of you know, startups that supports and that comes out of these kind of conferences. Um, Barcelona Activa is a government agency um, that was founded with the, the, the Catalonian, um, agent, uh, Catalonian government and the local city government. And today they are the um, agency that helps to support any businesses, whether they're a startup or a new business um, or any professional that wants to uh, develop their career. And this is their landing page. Um, as you can see, they're very forefront about um, how they want to be attractive to uh, business from around the world. Um, if those who can't see, it says, are you looking for a city where you can develop your professional project and at the same time enjoy a high quality of life? Do it in Barcelona. So um, this marketing campaign is, uh, was pretty remarkable to us. And just to actually also note, um, they have pretty much consolidated probably like seven or eight different times of, uh, types of functions um, that you know, the government or private sector or the community um, organizations will uh, perform um, in one building. And so anybody who really wants to um, access Barcelona can come to this agency and they can get their needs served. Um, and they also host you know, mandatory welcome sessions so that um, everybody who also comes to Barcelona Activa could, be, could learn how to navigate it and use it best, best for their best. So what about Boston? And we also have a very beautiful landscape as well. And we have you know, iconic buildings, um, buildings that are also very eco-friendly, as the Genzyme building um, to the upper right, and uh, of course, ICA and Strata Center. And we have historic landmarks, um, like the Quincy Market and um, the Beacon Hill area, and we, we believe that there, we have all the assets that Barcelona has uh, has leveraged to promote itself and create a brand as a city that is forward thinking and innovative. And in terms of our ecosystem, I mean, this is just a small snapshot of the kind of um, businesses and, and universities that are here, and also um, you know, major sports teams, and and, um, and we also have our own very unique his, uh, story in the U.S. history. Um, and so, you know, combining the, the last two slides, um, if we were to really put a stake in the ground as uh, Greater Boston as a brand, um, we really are a city, a, a global city, a capital of innovation and talent. So if we put that into a sentence where we can promote um, ourselves as a, a business or community that's um, about economic growth and that's friendly to businesses, we can say that Boston is not only a birthplace of ideas and innovation, but also a birthplace of great companies for the best and the world's best and ideal teams. So we also have our own, own global events, um, Future N, which got started at MindTech, by MindTech two years ago, and that now is on its third year. Um, we have a decision to make it into um, our own North by Northwest, um, really convening the, the greatest marketing minds from all over the world um, in Boston and, and talk about the future of marketing. Uh, even from our university standpoint, MIT Enterprise Forum, uh, the TEDx Boston has been, I just heard from Danielle that we got 3 million um, visits, um, views, and that's remarkable. And you know, we also have the Boston Marathon. And so we have these events that are going around, um, but in terms of how they kind of bring together a brand, um, a marketing, marketing message that really promotes Greater Boston as uh, a unified brand, um, maybe we're, there's still room for um, an expo like the Innovation Expo, where we really uh, communicate that um, not only do we have these great industries represented here um, and great sporting events and all that, um, we're really all about innovation and, um, and, and promoting ourselves to how relevant we are in um, the future of business. So. And in terms of resources that are available here, um, I just picked four, um, but we have so many, as we all know. I know MyTex and Boston Globe, um, um, Boston World Partnerships, we're all trying to sort of market a segment of uh, 
and this pace of Boston, but again, I think our challenge is that we're not as consolidated and there isn't a sort of common theme that um, goes through all of them to um, make us present ourselves um, just as, a, as a unit. And that's a challenge that um, we're trying to address. So some ideas that we um, came up with is also you know, kind of being inspired by what Barcelona Activa does um, to host welcome sessions. I thought that Boston World at Boston could also have welcome sessions and have welcome packages for new entrants to, to our region. And um, this is a, would be a great opportunity for um, you know, organizations like the, um, on the right hand side to come together and to create this sort of marketing campaign. Um, and to generate the idea, uh, those ideas and then um, actually come up with um, a smart um, uh, campaign that worked for all of us. You know, some ideas that were put out there actually by Debbie, um, who is president of uh, MindTech and um, the woman who's behind Future M is to maybe do a marketing hackathon where we get the best minds in the marketing industry to uh, brainstorm and come up with applications where we could um, market Massachusetts and Um, and with that sort of marketing uh, Boston, uh, what, another idea that we really love that um, the Barcelona Medical Biomedical Research Park did is that they have a full-time staff who looks at all the publications that um, the six of six research centers that um, the park has has ever published. So this goes to demonstrate the quality, um, you know, the credentials, and um, sort of verify that this park has, not only is a beautiful building, but it really is producing cutting edge research that's making a difference and getting publicized. And so, um, and it seems like a very simple thing, but I don't think there's anybody, in, you know, if there's any organization that really has taken this on um, and to do this relentless storytelling about Boston. Um, in, our in our latest conversation with um, Debbie, she had recommended um, a firm called uh, high Fire, um, where they created a software called Curata that takes all the uh, content that's generated um, about a brand, identifies it, organizes it, and makes it very easy for um, for the community to share or that that brand or the company to share. And so it was mm. maybe creating something or leveraging a local business um, to help us to to um, tell our story better um, mm -hmm. is, you know, an idea that we can really, you know, uh, explore more and um, leverage technology to to um, create a, a program where we can um, gather all the, the um, publications about Boston and then be able to uh, communicate it and then empower our community to share it. Um, of course, there's always an option to hire a PR firm, and so. Um, so in summary, um, uh, five ideas that I just leave with you is maybe an idea that you want to explore further um, this afternoon or a spin-off of one of these ideas could be something that you might be interested in posting later today. Um, you know, is we really need to come together, work together to um, have create a brand and then uh, work together on, on our marketing strategy and um, leverage our best assets and events and um, our collective um, uh, communities that we represent to to um, work together. That was my vision. That's how I viewed the situation. Um, so some of the comments are uh, filtered through my vision. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, one of the things that I came away with, from, both from uh, Israel but primarily from Spain, um, there's more of a socialist culture. Uh, the, the public funds are very prevalent. They're not coordinated. Uh, they don't have the, uh, the bureaucracy that we have sometimes to get something done here uh, because the government is funding it to make it happen. Uh, and that, that is a major component as you go through some of the initiatives that we looked at uh, and thought about in, in our discussions. Uh, the other thing, too, is zoning and, and the federal, state, regular, regional regulations. Uh, were much more permissive, at least as explained to me in the meetings. Uh, so you can be assured that I'm not going to set up an office over there. So yeah. my future would not be as rewarded. Uh, 
And that's also very important because uh, they can make they can coordinate all of their, their regional resources mm -hmm. towards an objective. And one of the things that I noticed is that the various groups that we met with um, at uh, the uh, symposiums, this was a lot of cross-pollination. People from the region, people from the state, from the city, uh, sat on similar boards and they coordinated their activities. And it was very important to uh, direct uh, resources towards an objective. Once the objective of a public policy was identified, it appeared that everyone mobilized to achieve that uh, objective, which is a struggle sometimes that I find, at least in the, uh, in, the, in the greater Boston economy, that there are many different competing objectives that are not necessarily all focused at the same time. Uh, so that's the backdrop that, that I came away with, and I'll go through some of the things that, uh, you know, that were of particular interest to someone like myself, and I think many of us on the trip as well as to the city of Boston, I would think. As I indicated, uh, real estate is not necessarily about the cost per square foot, it's how do you attract and retain and have people stay with you and grow with you. And a critical component, as I see, is a barrier to entry in the greater Boston area. And I look at it differently, I, I consider it the greater Boston area, is the cost of housing. Um, and I know that there are a lot of initiatives being uh, talked about in terms of smaller units, uh, or our responsive units. Uh, the concern I have with that is bringing capital to the, to the table uh, to do that. Unlike Spain, where the government decided that in their innovation district they needed housing, it appeared it was done, and Joe will go through some of the uh, slides on that perhaps, but uh, here uh, you have competing interests. You have lenders, you have investors. Uh, what's your exit strategy? How do you make it work? Uh, I'm not convinced it's a price point or a size issue because if it, if it truly becomes a vibrant area, uh, the cost for that small unit will perhaps become unaffordable to the average person. I think you have to look at it and say, what's the role of government in this? Are there loan guarantees that the developer can come in and do the smaller unit to make it financially viable? Can those units be flexible? Can they adapt to a changing environment so that if you need an exit strategy, the lender is protected, the investors are protected. Um, so to, to, to focus on the issue as merely, you know, the, the market demands small units, or a, I don't think it's necessarily the, the be all and end all. I think you have to look at other cities across this country uh, where areas became very popular and very cheap to live in. Uh, there were parts of the nation where people were paying three thousand dollars for a you know, seven hundred foot square, seven hundred foot square unit. Um, uh, as a, a very undesirable area, but an activated area. Um, you know, but I think that's one of the things that this young will have to struggle with because of the, for, for instance, the seaport becomes an attractive area and it's really become activated. Uh, those small units will be priced out of the average uh, person to the people that we want to track to that area. So I think the challenge to a group like this, to the state and city, is to what are our objectives, how do we achieve them, how do we coordinate our resources to eliminate the risk that we have that uh, perhaps Spain doesn't have because the government plays a much stronger role. They assume the risk versus uh, the private developer here assumes the risk. Um, I also believe that uh, one of the things that we should look at here versus what I saw in Spain, there was Tom, I think, spoke to it. You have to incentivize uh, uh, a developer to, uh, to explore some of these uh, innovative ideas. Uh, you know, if you want a developer to put 10 or 15 percent affordable units, there has to be bigger incentives. In terms of tax breaks, or cost of funds, etc., loan guarantees, uh, uh, there's a whole uh, body of uh, potential solutions or uh, things that should be looked at. Uh, The other issue that I uh, spoke a little bit about is, uh, is the, uh, is, I indicated the credit risk as well as the market risk. Um, one of the problems that I see um, in trying to um, create a new uh, environment is that one bad project paints <coughs> the whole district. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we're never going to get it 100% right, but we should spend the time and coordinate the resources to make it uh, as, as 
positive and it's less successful because it's possible you can't do any information yet. And um, I, you know, I, and I think that what we saw, I think even Tom Hall spoke about it, what really kick-started the, uh, the Seaport District was the Johnson family. I mean, they wrote the checks. They didn't have to rely on a lender or they assumed the credit risk. Um, and I remember closing deals at Nutter back in, right after they first went there, and you'd leave the office at 11 o'clock at night, you couldn't get a cab, and you'd stand there for an hour. But now it's, it's really become, in, in, in 10 or 15 years, that is going to be the place where you'll want to be in Boston uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, and as a result, this, the housing strategies, the building strategies, the open space strategies that we put in place today um, have to be responsive to those needs and um, do not price the type of uh, innovation or creative talent that we want to retain out of the market. Now what may happen is you shift them to other areas of the city, the, the, uh, the town, and um, that means that uh, public transportation has to be um, a chief focus. As we sit here and talk about potential cuts in T-service, um, it, it may be the critical component that will allow the Seaport District to develop um, and shift the talent pool to other areas that has quick access to Seaport. Um, the whole, the whole uh, mantra of the trip both to Spain and to Israel was innovation. And innovation is a dynamic process. Um, and I always tell people who uh, work for me that when we, when we start a project, what was, the, what was the original public policy behind um, the, the regulation or the ordinance that we're looking at? And if the public policy is not being advanced, let's change the public policy. Mm -hmm. How do you change the public policy? Well, groups like this bring it to the forefront, discuss what our objectives are, uh, and, and move forward. I, in my prior career, I, was, I did economic research for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and I used to always come back to this issue that from 1933 until 1981, the banking laws in the United States did not change. They were static. The, the laws were the same, but the way we transacted business changed dramatically. So if we look at something and say, well, the regulations don't permit it, then let's stop, let's look at it, let's change it. Uh, and that requires a joint effort among many different uh, public interest groups. The challenge is to coordinate those public interest groups to say, what is the objective that we as a city, as a district, as a region um, would want to achieve? How do we get that? How do we bring everyone together? And as I said earlier, one of the things I was impressed with in Spain is there was this cross-pollination of, of parties. Uh, you'd go to uh, academic uh, symposiums and there'd be people from the city or the region as part of those, um, those panel discussions, which tells me that the information is being shared and the policy is being directed. So, uh, those were my impressions from a pragmatic standpoint, um, and I think that uh, I'll turn it over to Joe, and he can talk about, you have more pictures than I do. So, go ahead. Okay. so um, you didn't have more capital. Oh, capital. Well, the, the, the capital, I, I actually think the capital is, is more prevalent here. Uh, I think there's, there's the ability to tap into capital is, is great here. Um, it's, uh, it seems to be more regulated or, or sparse over there, I find. Uh, no one ever answered the question directly. The, the government does fund initially and takes uh, an equity stake or a, uh, a stakeholder of interest in the beginning, but it was unclear how they, they ratchet to the next level as far as I was concerned. And, and that's really key relative to the barrier to entry. Um, as we think about them um, internationally, as we think about them in Greater Boston, um, and, and think about the differences of capital sources, where both in Haifa and in uh, Barcelona and Madrid, uh, such a huge part of the available capital and the infused capital is public money. Um, and you'll see that theme throughout uh, what I talk about and, and, and everything that, that Bob has just mentioned relative to housing. Um, you know, keep in mind that. Uh, in Catalonia, it's a 23% unemployment rate. In a hugely suffering economy, we felt pretty lucky with where we are in Boston compared to them. Um, and, and the whole idea of the barriers to entry, we talked about housing, we talked about also you know, making connections. 
um, you know, what are the connectors that, that entrepreneurs and, uh, and others that come in um, to, to, to uh, a place uh, find so that they can navigate. Uh, and, and I think that Barcelona has done this pretty well and in an integrated way. You've heard several things about uh, Barcelona Activa. And Barcelona Activa is not just a place, but it's a tantamount to a factory, I mean, a continuum that starts from the early stages of company formation or ideas, uh, bringing them all the way through training and, uh, um, and, and even permitting and, and, uh, and funding. So it's all located in that one building, and, and people have access to it, and it's very prevalent. Uh, but keep in mind, it's a munic municipal agency, it's, uh, and, and, and it's not private. So um, you know, there's plenty of resources there, technology, and, and training. Um, the numbers are significant when you look at what, uh, what kind of success Barcelona Activa has had uh, since 1986, since its formation. Um, and and you know, these kinds of numbers uh, you know, really talk to the success, uh, but also the need um, in Barcelona. And, and in Barcelona, it's not just high tech or just innovation, uh, but uh, restaurants and, and uh, you know, common uh, businesses that have come through uh, and, and, and survive, and, and 85% of them after the third year, and that's really the major measure of success. Um, making connections continues through, you heard a lot about the 22 app district, but again, it's a municipal company, and so it's different from Boston's innovation district, but it's I, I, ideologically uh, similar in the sense that it's a, a place. Um, you know, you, you see the, the, the geography, you see how it's located by the seaport, you see the, the, the special buildings. Um, and so they talk about it in three ways, or urban innovation, the city, economic innovation, the companies, and social innovation, the people. And the programs that support 22 Act really focus on all three of those areas. Uh, BioCAP was another government agency uh, created in 2006, uh, bringing together reps from all areas of biomedicine um, the technology sector from universities, research centers, companies, and support bodies. But the good thing about you know, BioCat uh, you know, really is how it, it's so interconnected, not just nationally, but, but internationally. And, and part of its uh, uh, mission is to bring these companies in from other parts of the world. Um, and uh, you know, its mission, again, is to dynamize the stakeholders in the area, um, research systems, active paper of knowledge, entrepreneurial uh, business fabric, all important pieces um, and, and really institutionalized, but again, under the foundation of the public. And, and talking about biotechnology, you saw the, uh, the other speakers talk about um, the, the biomedical research park, and that's as much a place, as much a, an identity, uh, besides its location and building, uh, as anything else. But again, this is a huge organization uh, that is internationally known and, and a, not just a connector for uh, biology and research uh, and, and medicine in Barcelona, but uh, attracting people worldwide. On to Madrid, uh, Promo Madrid was uh, a significant and again interconnected body, government owned, uh, and, and again, uh, really with a huge mission for uh, uh, reaching out internationally and promoting the economic development of the Madrid region. Next slide, I'm hoping you can read better on a big screen. Obviously not, it was a model that really talked to the universe of, of what they're bringing in. And, and to me, it, it spelled diversity of, uh, of business types and, and, uh, and focus areas. Um, the thing about Madrid is uh, you know, their focus was in three, three areas. One was uh, foreign direct investment, so assisting companies uh, financially through their first stages of business activity, so bringing, bringing companies in from outside but investing in them. Second, uh, for branding the region, so we've heard a lot about the brand, um, but that kind of outreach and developing that sense of identity that attracts uh, companies and people. And then in, in trade promotion, um, which really talks to the design and development of, of the international strategy. Uh, Promo Madrid was very exciting and, and robust uh, program but supported by other agencies that were working with them, uh, again, funded by the government.
And last, when you talk about barriers to entry, you have to consider transportation. You heard a little bit about that here. Um, this is uh, the, the, uh, the high speed rail, uh, three, uh, 300 kilos, 200 miles per hour from uh, Barcelona to Madrid in two hours. Uh, you know, just uh, speaking about a comparison, it, it would bring us from Washington, D.C. to Boston in three hours. Uh, that kind of connection is significant. You know, when you think about um, not just the cost, but what the, what the benefit of that could be uh, to enhance transportation regionally and, and even nationally, um, it would bring a lot more commerce and a lot more uh, interconnectivity between uh, uh, clusters and between uh, regions. Uh, you know, transportation, the MBTA is a, a great infrastructure, it could use some improvements. Um, but when you look at Boston and New England, um, it's not like you know, New York or New Jersey that has a much bigger you know, concentric reach because of uh, their rail um, um, system. And so wouldn't it be great to, to pull more people in from southern Maine or western Massachusetts you know, to come to work for the day? Um, so that kind of connector is an important connector as well. Um, so as we look to the barriers to entry, uh, you know, we look at uh, um, high housing costs, uh, we look at uh, you know, the geography, we look at uh, the role of the World Class Cities Partnership, um, but we talk really clearly about uh, you know, the, the uh, barriers to entry being the, the connectors. Mm -hmm. One way we talked about the connectors was really about uh, a catcher's mitt, um, you know, a catcher's mitt for young entrepreneurs to come in to Boston and, and where do they go? Um, it seems pretty obvious in Barcelona with the robust um, availability of information about places like Activa, 22 Watt, ERBB, and, uh, and Biocat and others to find the place. Um, there are so many uh, organizations and resources, uh, not so many public, but many private or quasi-public uh, private that are, are there to assist, but it's not so obvious to the young entrepreneur or innovator exactly where to go. Uh, so you talked a little bit about welcoming, welcoming sessions and packages. That's a, a great opportunity, a great start. You know, guides, directories, um, a central repository for the person to raise their hand and get funneled to the right location you know, would be a, a really good start uh, to really tap into and, and utilize and leverage the resources that we have uh, in Greater Boston today. Joe, yeah, sure, that's a great point because as I said earlier, the one of the things I noticed is, and I, I actually believe it was because of the cross-pollination of these groups, is that there was a clear articulated path of someone into the system. Where you go for capital, where you go for uh, assistance on zoning or, or permitting and change. One of the problems that I see, or in, and it's not just Boston, it's great in, in Mass Eastern Massachusetts, is that where you enter the system, and who you talk to dictates what path you take versus a a common target where everyone put funnels you towards that target. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of positives in place in Greater Boston to really do the connector thing, um, you know, sponsorship. Uh, we talk about leveraging consulates. We talk about academia and their role. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities to improve transportation and, and look at other alternatives uh, you know, to rail and, and again, uh, improve our reach to communities uh, where housing is. Uh, you know, more affordable and people can live. The main problem in Greater Boston, which has been a problem for a long time, is, is housing and, and really needs to be resolved. Um, and I love the idea that uh, in North Dakota right now, uh, you know, the, there's a huge expansion with the oil fields and a huge lack of housing. And the issue isn't the cost of housing there, it's how fast can you build it. Um, but companies like Walmart are, are um, subsidizing and underwriting and building housing for their employees. And the question really is, how do we build, for me, how do we build uh, the value of just the competitive value of being in Massachusetts, so much so that companies like Vertex could do the same thing? Because I'm not quite sure we're going to get public money to really help the kind of, and that, that model didn't work in the Honest District because once um, you get past the, past the, the construction of the property and, and real estate, then the Fair Housing Act uh, you know, really doesn't allow you to, to maintain the intended purpose, helping artists. And, uh, and then the economy takes over and, and that location becomes gentrified. 
really good opportunity for the developer, but not so much for the initial contractors. And to that point, in the last two years, I've had a number of clients that are actually a major project working towards developing workforce housing, which mm -hmm. is a way of circumventing some of the regulations that prohibit achieving some of the objectives that you may wish to, to explore for purposes of creating affordable and responsive housing. So workforce housing is, is, is becoming both. So as Michael pulls the hook out of here, <laughs> I'd like to turn it over to Michael. Um, and thank everybody for their attention. Uh, something I should have mentioned earlier, by the way, before I start is for anybody who is tweeting, we do have a hashtag um, world class city is all one word. Um, what, one of the things that I think we would all agree is that uh, the people of Barcelona are long term strategic thinkers. Um, in Tom and Lowell's presentation, you saw the design of their city. That was a design that was created in 1859 and to this day is still being implemented. Um, so there is a real vision and strategy in just about everything they do. And that applies to towns as well, and uh, their development, attraction, and retention of talent. Now, these, these three segments um, of talent is really what defines uh, an area's workforce. So the first one, in terms of talent development, it is a strategic vision for how we allow young people to go through uh, the entire talent pipeline. And no matter what stage they exit that pipeline, that they have the skills they need to find the jobs that are available. Um, so that employers have the, the workforce that they need and that people have the, the means to, to stay in the city, to raise their family, and to add to the economic vitality of the city. In Madrid, um, we, we explored some of uh, the new curriculum that they're adding to the K through 12 system. Uh, it's done through a foundation called Fundacion create, um, and what this is doing is bringing entrepreneurship into the K-12 curriculum, teaching values, attitudes, mindsets of entrepreneurship. Um, they are uh, truly um, experimenting with this, they will launch this fall, uh, but one of the interesting aspects to this program is that they're not only teaching the success of being an entrepreneur, but they're incorporating the challenges and failures as well to teach young people that failure is part of the process, that it is okay, it's about the effort, and that it's about how you lift yourself up after the fact. And that's quite frankly something I don't think we do enough here in Boston. We need to celebrate the attempts, not just the successes, but every attempt. Um, in Barcelona, you've heard a lot about Barcelona Antiver, and I'm gonna talk about it as bit more, but one program within that is called Porta 22. Porta 22 analyzes market trends. They, they have a sense of where jobs are being created, what skills are needed, so that they can better align the education system and the job training uh, opportunities for their, their uh, residents uh, to, to better match the workforce needs of companies. Um, this upper right hand photo is actually a screenshot from an online tool that they have created about, cre uh, about uh, cre uh, enhancing one's interviewing skills. Uh, this brings you through a series of interviews. In this particular scene, uh, it's at the end of an interview, a woman has just spilled coffee on the interviewer. Uh, so it, it really brings you through a variety uh, of situations that you may find yourself in, and different um, personality types. She happens to be labeled the aggressive interviewee. Um, so uh, she, she does help this gentleman clean his pants and it gets a little awkward. Uh, <laughs> so it, it does teach you a lot, I will say. Uh, in terms of talent attraction, talent attraction, and this is something that Barcelona Activa is paramountly involved in, and as it has already been said, this is a government agency. It truly does everything you need to do uh, to create economic development within the city. It is a, like a one-stop shop. Um, and in fact, I need to just lead this list of things that they do because it is quite extensive. 
They have an entrepreneur's, uh, entrepreneur's resource center, incubator space, center for job skills training, center for vocational skills training, technology park, a center for technology skills training, uh, business plan development, mentoring, and permitting and licensing uh, procedures so that if you have a business idea, that you can go in in the morning, and when you walk out that afternoon, you have every permit, license, and everything you need to start your company the next day. Imagine that kind of streamlined process in Boston. <laughs> yeah, there is hope. Uh, now do it in Barcelona. This is the city's premier talent attraction program. Uh, if you, they have uh, five different areas. Startup, if you want to start up a business in Barcelona, they have resources for that. Work, if you want to move to Barcelona and look for a job, and this is all geared to people outside of the city, uh, then they have resources for that. If you want to research or study, or even just move to Barcelona, they have resources for all of that. So they are not only making it easy for people to integrate themselves into the, the city, but they're actually taking this uh, model on the road. They're promoting their city and they are attracting talent. They're attracting local talent. Um, one of the major pushes is through internship. And why not? It makes sense. If you're teaching someone skills, why not give them an opportunity to not only test those skills, but also build the network, the professional network they need to find jobs after they graduate. So in, in this area, uh, they have three programs. Uh, and talking about branding, everything is 22 app. So the first one is 22 app degree. And this is uh, bringing students uh, who are in the world's most prestigious universities and colleges to Barcelona to take, do an internship in the 22 app district. This 22 app BCAP, uh, leveraging the consulates, their consulates uh, around the world to attract talent. And finally, if, if you, it's not just the local talent, it's not just talent around the world, it's talent right here in Massachusetts that they're attracting. There is a specific program called MIT Spain, where they're attracting MIT students to go to Barcelona. So I say this not into it as a direct competition, but we are competing on a global scale now. So if we're not retaining our talent from Massachusetts, we are truly at a disadvantage. Talent retention. Um, we don't do the best at keeping our greatest minds, and our inability to retain talent, uh, in my opinion, is the equivalent of Coca-Cola hiring, hiring somebody, teaching them how to make Coke, and then firing them the very next day so that they can either join Pepsi or start their own company. That's what we do in Massachusetts, by training students, by bringing uh, it, the best talent in the world to one spot, and then not having them, uh, not having opportunities for them to stay, whether it be employability or the lack of a job. Now, this is actually complicated on an international level, even further in visa issues. To me, and this is my personal uh, opinion, it is crazy that we bring talent from around the world. Our colleges and universities are, without a doubt, one of the strongest assets the greater Boston community has. They are a magnet for talent. We, instead of leveraging that, what do we do 30 days after graduation, unless they have been sponsored, students are kicked out, right? As, that's the code model, right? You, you teach somebody everything you know, and then you get rid of them. It just doesn't make sense. We, we do need to rethink this, and when, when there is a lack of a talented workforce, it leads to, to the disappearance of businesses. And when those businesses disappear, we lose jobs. So another series of programs that Barcelona actively coordinates is the 22 at Staying in Company is the translation. And again, it's three programs. It's 22 at Masters, 22 at MBA, and 22 at FP. Now you can probably guess what the first two are. It's attracting students to do internships in Barcelona, from Barcelona, um, if you're getting a graduate or postgraduate degree, or if you're attending one of the business schools. The third one is the 22 FP. is about giving internship opportunities to students who are in more vocational training, training centers. Um, you know, one of the, the lessons learned 
I think, is that talent truly is a city's product. And that product has to be, able, like any other product, has to be able to adjust with demand, and it needs to be protected. So with talent as our greatest asset, we have to fully leverage that talent, leverage the opportunities to create it, we have to protect it, and it is the foundation of our economic development. You know, it's a rare occasion, I think, especially uh, these days, to have political agreement of any kind. But uh, it's probably even more rare to have political agreement on the state, federal, and local levels. Um, you know, in, in President Obama's State of the Union address, he talks about the fact that we have twice as many openings, um, job openings, than we have workers qualified to fill those jobs. And in Massachusetts, we have about 240,000 unemployed residents. Yet at the same, very same time, we have 120,000 job openings. We can cut our unemployment in half simply by training the people who don't have work right now for the skills they need to take one of these other jobs. Deval Patrick, Governor Patrick's uh, State of the State Address, he talks about closing that skill gap and uh, giving students in, in mid-career professionals the opportunity to change their skill set, adapt their skill set to the jobs that we now have. We have an opportunity here with the president fully behind us to leverage federal, federal funding to make our programs in Massachusetts more robust. Uh, we have Dr. Fifield here and Jesse Thompson from Bunker Hill Community College. I want to just take a moment to congratulate Bunker Hill. I think there's been a lot to talk about our community colleges and there's plenty of room for improvement. Uh, and this is in, in part in, in, uh, a resource question. But Bunker Hill Community College has done tremendous things. They've created Community Center for Entrepreneurship. Um, this is an opportunity for students at Bunker Hill Community College, but also members of the community to, to attend lectures, to attend uh, mentoring sessions, and to do some of that which Barcelona Activa is already doing. Uh, you know, a few years ago, the Dukakis Center at, uh, at Northeastern University did a study on manufacturing in Massachusetts. And we know that there are about 300,000 manufacturing jobs still in Massachusetts. That study identified that over a 10-year period of time, as many as 100,000 jobs will become available. Now, that, those are not all new jobs. Much of it is due to a uh, retiring uh, workforce. But the fact of the matter is, right now, we are training a handful, just a handful of young people to fill those jobs. So what does that mean? That means those companies have a choice. They either shut down or they relocate. Either way, it's a loss of jobs for Massachusetts. I want to commend Mayor Menino. I, I think one of the highlights of his State of the City address was when he talked about the transformation of Madison Park High School. I think he, he has hit the nail on the head, as they say, because he's not only identified an opportunity to give students in, in the city an opportunity, but he's identified a way to leverage our city assets, in this case a school, uh, so that when it shuts down at the end of the school day, it is open to the community for job skills training. I think it's a brilliant idea. I think uh, it's our responsibility to support such ideas and to shepherd them forward. And finally, I want to say that we do have existing programs in Massachusetts. It's not that they don't exist, but it's that we must do everything we possibly can to leverage all of these programs and so many more so that we do create a better talent pipeline to fit the needs of our employers and to give the people of Massachusetts an opportunity to find a meaningful job, one that fits their skills, that fits their interests, and allows them to stay in our state. With that, I wanna thank all of our panelists today. Um, I'm gonna ask that um, uh, we hold questions till the second panel, which is uh, the second half of which is meant to be an open conversation. We'll integrate any questions you have about Barcelona and Boston and the connections between the two into that discussion. But before I do that, I want to just thank all of our panelists here uh, with a small token of our appreciation. Now, 
We have time for a five-minute break. There's coffee in the back. There are restrooms just outside.